May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the occupational hazards for um, preachers is that they can very easily talk the talk, but of course the test for all of us as Christians is how we walk the walk. Uh, And I have to walk the walk in a particular way today because last Sunday I preached about how in all of the scriptures, Old and New Testaments, there is eternal truth which is of relevance to us. And so today, on this Trinity Sunday, I am preaching from Isaiah 40, our Old Testament reading, which John read for us. Of course, if you were listening very carefully to John, um, you would note that the word Trinity did not appear anywhere in that reading from Isaiah 40. Indeed, the word Trinity does not appear anywhere in all of the scriptures. Indeed, the word Trinity was not in common use among Christians until about 200 years or 250 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And yet that word Trinity, which we have today as Trinity Sunday, even if the word isn't used, who it describes has always been there. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament revealed in Jesus and in the coming of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Trinity has always existed. And so we turn to Isaiah. Isaiah, of course, was a prophet. And when we think of the word prophet today, we think of someone who tells the future. You know, you can think of someone who's maybe an economist or someone who talks about climate change and someone will say, oh, they're prophetic. They're saying what's going to happen in the future. And while the prophets in the Old Testament did sometimes say what was going to happen in the future, that wasn't their whole job description. If we wanted to give them a job description, it's that they were revealers. They were revealers from God. They revealed truth from God. Sometimes that truth was about the future, Sometimes it was about consequences, saying to God's people, if you don't change your ways, this is what's going to happen, like those who talk about climate change or economics today. But very often, and particularly in this chapter of Isaiah 40, the prophets are revealing truth about God himself, what he is like, who he is, what it means to know him. Some of you will remember from your time in national school, I know I do it with um, our national school here in Tana um, very regularly, a particular children's song. And it goes like this. I'm going to spare you me singing it, but I'll give you the words nonetheless. Our God is a great big God and he holds us in his hands. And it goes on in the chorus to say, he's higher than a skyscraper, he's deeper than a submarine, he's wider than the universe and beyond my wildest dreams. He's known me and he's loved me since before the world began. How wonderful to be a part of God's amazing plan. Our God is a great big God. And like all good children's songs, there are actions, but I will spare you the actions, because a man doing actions in a pulpit in robes is definitely not an appealing sight. But that song summarizes what Isaiah is revealing about God. Our God is a great big God, and he holds us in his hands. Listen to Isaiah's rhetorical questions at the beginning of our reading. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counsellor has instructed him? Whom did he consult for his enlightenment, and who taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding. They're rhetorical questions because the answer has to be nobody. Who could teach God, our creator, anything? Nobody. On a clear night 
We can be like the psalmist and Sammy who talks about the heavens and the stars. Uh, and you know, you, if you go out on a clear night, um, as we've had a few recently, and you can see the stars, uh, and we can see the immensity of creation. The same feeling that the psalmist had about how great creation is and yet how small we are compared to it. Well, the message of the psalm is, if creation is so immense, how much greater must the creator be? As Isaiah goes on, even the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as dust on the scales. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. That is what Isaiah the prophet reveals to us about God, that he is a great big God and he holds us in his hands. A few years ago, I haven't seen it um, in recent years, but about 10 or 15 years ago, um, you would often see people with t-shirts or maybe with a sticker on their car that said atheism and non-profit religion. Atheism and non-profit religion. And of course, it's not just talking about the profits that we make in terms of money. It's talking about profits like Isaiah. It's very witty. And it's fundamentally true. Because if we choose to not listen to prophets like Isaiah, the only logical alternative is atheism, or at the very least, agnosticism, and having no clue what God is like. Because we can only know God and comprehend God as God reveals himself to us. We need God to tell us what he is like. Otherwise, we're in the dark. There's a story from the Far East about three blind men who were blind from birth. And they had never seen an elephant. Now, most of us have probably never seen an elephant either. But uh, they could have seen an elephant if they had been able to see. And one day they encountered an elephant. And they felt this elephant to see what he was like. The first man came along and he felt the elephant's side. And he said, an elephant is like a wall. The second one came along and caught the elephant by the tail and said, an elephant is like a snake. And the third one came along and felt the elephant's tusk and said, an elephant is like a spear. Were they right? They were partially right. But that is the condition of all of us unless God tells us what he is like. We are in the dark, feeling our way, trying to guess what we think God is like. That is why there are so many ideas of God down through history from philosophies and from religions. But we do not need to guess because God has taught us what he is like. How different would it have been for these three blind men if the elephant had started to speak and told them, no, you're wrong. I'm actually like this. Or if someone had come along who could see the elephant and could describe it to them. Well, that's what the prophets do. God reveals his truth to them so they can share it with his people. And because by his spirit they speak, it is God himself revealing his truth to us. What's this got to do with the Trinity? We can summarize the Trinity and say it's one God in three persons. There's an image like the shield of the Trinity which can help us get our minds around us. There is the Athanasian Creed and the other creeds of the church which attempt to put it into human language. And as I often say, if you're bored in a sermon, I won't mind if you turn to the back of your prayer book and read things like the Athanasian Creed. But the Athanasian Creed says things like this on the screen. There is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghosts. And in his Trinity, this Trinity, none is a fore or after other, none is greater or less than another, but the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal. Deep breath. It's a mouthful. 
Because the thing that gives me assurance on this Trinity Sunday, that the Trinity is true and revealed by God, is why in their right mind would anyone make it up? How or why would anyone make that up about God? It is complicated. It is hard to get our heads around, as we should expect about God, our creator. The only reason to believe in the Trinity, to believe that there is God the Father who sent his son Jesus, who reveals himself as the Son and sends the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity, is because God reveals it and because it is true on that account. Why else would we believe it? If we choose, as so many people have done, to reject the Trinity for something simpler, we can sympathise with them. But to do that is to reject God as he reveals himself. How rude rude would it be if someone was telling you about themselves and you say, ah yeah, that's fine, that's what you say, but I prefer to think something else about you. We so often do that with God. We prefer to think of God in the way that suits us, which is simpler, which is more comfortable than the God as he reveals himself in the scriptures. It would be wrong for a doctor to tell the patient sitting in front of them that everything was going to be fine if they knew it wasn't. It's false comfort. And that is what we are effectively doing if we choose our own ideas, our own made-up God, as opposed to God who reveals himself as he truly is. The hymn 680 is very popular. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? And that is the question I conclude with today. Because the anchor we need in life is not a made-up God of our own imaginings, which is comfortable but the true and living God, the God who reveals himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A made-up God might suit us when all is going well, but when things aren't going well, and of course that's a when, not an if, we need the anchor which comes from knowing the only God as he truly reveals himself to be our great big God, who holds us in his hands. And now to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be all praise, dominion, glory, and power, forever and ever. Amen.